You know, one thing that fascinates me is psychology. I, I, I enjoy psychology. You know, I, I wonder why do people do what they do? I'm very interested in personality types, like your D personalities, your S personalities, your C personalities. It's very interesting to watch the different personality types. And, and I wonder why some people can go through difficulties in their life and rise above it. And then others just can't seem to ever get past it. And so psychology to me is fascinating. I also find belief as really fascinating. Why are some people willing to challenge their beliefs? Maybe even change their beliefs. But other people are like, nope, nope, not going to challenge it, not going to ask any questions. Even if their beliefs are contradictory. I've noticed there's a lot of people that hold contradictory beliefs and I'm like I don't understand how that works and you know there's a movement and I've talked about this and you're going to see more of this as we're getting towards the return of Jesus unfortunately it's called deconstructing their faith and I've watched a lot of videos of people who are deconstructing their faith now I think there is good deconstruction I think it's good to challenge your beliefs why do I believe what I believe? I think that's healthy. For example, there's a lot of people that believe that the King James Version is the only version of the Bible that was delivered to the English-speaking people. I grew up in the King James environment. I think the King James is a great version. But many years ago, I was like, is it the only version? Really? Only translation? Even the King James translators didn't believe it was the only one. Read the preface. And so I, I came away with, hey, the King James is a great translation. If you want to use it, more power to you. If you want to preach out of it, more power to you. But I don't believe it's the only translation for the English-speaking people. Because that's kind of arrogant. Like God gave us our own translation and the rest of the world doesn't have theirs? It just didn't sit well with me. So that's, that's one of those beliefs that, yeah, I, I like the King James. is a great translation. If you use it, God bless you. But I think there's others that are just as good. But then there's some people... And churches, you'll see it often on the signs, KJV only. We're not going to use any other translation. And that just fascinates me, why some people don't want to challenge those beliefs. And, and listen, we should challenge our beliefs against Scripture, not against tradition. Because many times we believe things just because that's how I was raised. I'm sorry, that doesn't cut it with me. What does the Bible say? Never be afraid to ask questions. Truth is not afraid of a challenge. When you see politicians or whatever, and they won't debate something, or when you see people that they try to have a debate and they just yell and scream, that tells me truth is not on their side. Because if truth is on your side, you won't be afraid of the debate. You won't be afraid of the questions. So when it comes to what you believe, never be afraid to ask, why do I believe this? And go to the scriptures. Truth is not afraid of a challenge. However, there is another type of deconstruction that we see a lot of videos if you're out there on social media. And it's where people say, I used to be a Christian, but I am no longer. I, I saw one recently, a person said, I used to be a Christian, but I finally read the Bible, and I'm no longer a Christian. And I thought, that's interesting. How can this person say, I read the Bible and because of that, I'm no longer a Christian. And then I got people over here say, I read the Bible and because of that, I am a Christian. I was like, how does that, how does that work? And so a couple questions this morning is, why do people turn away from Jesus? And I think it's important for us to look at this. Understand why do people turn away from Jesus? Not to demonize those people. Pray for them. But why is it that we're seeing so many people turn away from Jesus? And the next question is, how do I ensure that I don't do that? How do I know that I won't deconstruct my faith and walk away from my faith? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 22. And we've been going through Luke real quickly. Uh, well, not real quickly, <laughs> for many years. <laughs> but uh, Luke chapter 22. It's the last few hours of Jesus' life. Luke chapter 22, verse 1, says the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
which is called Passover, was approaching. So it's the last night of Jesus' life. And it says that the scribes and Pharisees were looking for a way to put him, put Jesus to death, because they were afraid of the people. So this is the last few hours of Jesus' life. And the scribes and Pharisees were trying to figure out how they could get Jesus killed. Let me just stop and say this. If you, became, if you are a believer, you are in the army. You are in God's army. And you are going to be, and I am going to be, attacked. Because Satan wants us to turn away from the faith. Because that can destroy our testimony. That can maybe pull other people away from the faith. Spiritual warfare is occurring all around us. And the demonic forces that are around us, they want nothing more than to destroy believers and to destroy the church. And listen, if you don't know who you are in Christ, you're going to be vulnerable. They're going to come after you. They're going to do everything they can to derail you. And let me just say this about the demonic hordes that are in this world. They understand humans because they've been watching us for thousands of years. They can tell your vulnerabilities. They've been observing, and these fallen beings, these fallen angels, these sons of gods, these cherubim, seraphim, these fallen beings that have fallen, they are masters at the human race. They know how to manipulate people. And you know, when Jesus was on earth the first time, Satan was doing everything he could to destroy Jesus. It started right after he was born, right? He incited Herod to have all the babies killed in Bethlehem, hoping he could kill Jesus. And then when Jesus goes into the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, Satan tempts him, trying to derail Jesus. And then, Jesus, then Satan keeps sending demonically possessed people at Jesus, trying to derail Jesus. And now... Satan could not derail Jesus, so now he's going to work through the religious establishment, the scribes and the Pharisees. Yes, Satan can use religion to try to destroy people. And he's trying to work through the religious establishment. The religious leaders, they're looking for a way to destroy Jesus. So Satan had built up this religious establishment that had become so enamored with man-made traditions. They had lost God in the midst and here comes Jesus, and they don't like it, so they're trying to derail him. And Satan's thinking, I need one more thing that would really put a nail in this coffin. Because he knew that even the religious establishment so far hadn't been effective. So he needed somebody on the inside. If I can only get one of Jesus' apostles to flip, then I can get him. And we know that's what happened. If you look at verse 3, that man was Judas. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Now here's a question. I was thinking about this. Was Judas Iscariot an apostle who loved Jesus with all of his heart, soul, and mind, and then Satan just got him to flip and suddenly betray Jesus? Is that how that happened? I mean, because if that's the way it happened, couldn't that happen to us? Is it possible that I could just be in love with Jesus and Satan could trip me up and I just suddenly turn my back on Jesus? And the answer is no. That's right. It wasn't that, that Judas was in love with Jesus and Satan just suddenly got him to flip. In fact, the Gospel of John gives us some more insight about Judas. And, and John, when he tells this passage in his account, John chapter 13... He says this, now when it was time for supper, so he's talking about the same event, the Last Supper, the devil had, look at this, already put it in the heart of Judas. So Judas was already thinking about betraying Jesus. This was something he had been thinking about. And, and, and Satan had planted a seed in Judas before this happened, before he became possessed by Satan. And, and here's the thing, again, demonic hordes observe us, and I believe that as Satan watched Judas, he realized that Judas really wasn't a true follower of Jesus. And he realized that Judas really loved money more than anything else. If you go back to John chapter 12, it talks about that. Mary took a pound of perfume, Jesus is at the house, and this is, the, again, the last week of his life. 
Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, and of course John puts in there, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And then John adds this, this thought. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of it that was put into it. Now, I find that interesting. Now, i got to stop for a second. I like rabbit holes in the Bible because there's like rabbit holes everywhere. So we all follow me down a rabbit hole just for a second. John's gospel is the only gospel that called Judas a thief. And I got to think about that. Why did John call Judas a thief and Matthew, Mark, and Luke never called him a thief? Can I give you a little interesting theory? If you know, John and his brother James were the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee was a fisherman. But if you look back in Mark, when Jesus came along the seashore and said, follow me, it says that James and John left their father and the hired hands. And because of that phrase, many people think that Zebedee didn't just have a father and son fishing boat. He had a fishing business. They had other people working for them. And we know that John knew the high priest We know that in the Gospels. And that would be kind of unusual for just a fisherman to know the high priest. So a lot of people deduce that John's family was actually a wealthy family. And here's an interesting thing, too. You read in the Bible about some women that would always be there at crucial moments in Jesus' life. They were there at the crucifixion. They were there at the resurrection. And we also read in Luke that there were women who supported Jesus' ministry. In one of the Gospels, it says that Mary, Jesus' mother, was there at the foot of the cross and her sister. Another Gospel says Mary and Salome. And this has caused many, and again, we can't prove this, but this has caused some people to say that it's possible that Salome or Salome was Mary's sister. And if that's the case, and James and John were her son, she was married to Zebedee, then it's possible that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. And that kind of makes sense to me because who would Jesus take with him on special events? James and John and Peter. Makes sense to me too because if you remember, their mother goes up to Jesus and says, can you do me a favor? Put one of my boys on the right and the left. I think that's a possible theory that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus and that they were from a wealthy family. You say, well, where does this go with the thief thing? This is just a theory, but I have a feeling that there were times that they needed to do something or buy something and they would go to Judas and Judas would be like, we just don't have the money. And John might be talking to his mother And so you say, well, son, I don't know why you guys don't have the money because your father and I just made a big contribution to the ministry. Why is it that you guys never have money? Because we know that women supported the ministry. And I got a feeling that, you know, have you ever had that feeling like something's not right? And I got a feeling that John was starting to step back and thinking, why are we not have the money? I mean, we've been given some big chunks of money, my family. Why is it not here? And I think after all this happened, John stood back and he connected the dots. Oh, I know why we didn't have the money. Because Judas was stealing the money. He was a thief. And then when I look back at what Judas, when he was upset about the perfume thing, he didn't care about that. He cared about the money. And, And Judas, he sold Jesus for what? 30 pieces of silver. Judas cared about the money. See, it appears that Judas was never a follower of Jesus. In fact, about a year before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus taught this crazy thing in John chapter 6. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Now, the day before, like he had fed thousands of people, 
and they had followed him around the lake, and then he has this crazy teaching. And if you look at John, I think it's John 6, 66. That's interesting. It says, many of his disciples no longer walked with him. And Jesus turned to the 12, <clears throat> and he said, are you going to follow, are you going to leave me also? And if you remember, Peter said, no, Lord, where would we go? And Jesus replies to his 12 that are left standing there when many others had already left him. He says, didn't I choose you, the 12, yet one of you is a devil? He was referring to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the 12, because he was going to betray him. Listen, folks, Jesus chose Judas as one of his apostles. But Judas was never a follower of Jesus. And the reason I think some people deconstruct their faith is because some people falsely identify as Christians. They were never Christians to begin with. I mean, now, and this may not have been intentional, but a lot of people, you know, I was baptized as a baby and I grew up in the church, therefore I'm a Christian. Or, when I was young, my friends were walking forward, or I've heard this, and mom and dad told me to go forward, and I prayed the prayer, and I'm a Christian. But the reality is, they were never true Christians. They looked like it, they knew the lingo, they grew up in the church, they, they were members of the church, but they had never had an encounter with Jesus Christ. If you look at America, if you look at America, it's very interesting... <clears throat> Let me put a graph up there if we can get that up there. We're having problems. In America, in the 1940s, almost 75% of Americans went to church. And you can look at this graph. And then starting in the 1980s, we start seeing a decline. And then about 2000, it just starts going down like a rocket ship. We've gone from roughly 75% of Americans attending church to now less than 50%. Why is that? Well, there was a point in American history that if you were American, you were kind of, Christian was synonymous. You just went to church. But the reality is, as our culture has changed and moving away from God, many people are stepping out of the church because they were never believers to begin with. I mean, look at Judas. <clears throat> Go back to our passage. Look at Judas. It says, Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. He was one of the twelve. If you go to the next one here right after, this is when Judas actually betrays Jesus. So while he was speaking, suddenly a mob came and one of the twelve. Notice they keep calling Judas one of the twelve. He was one of the apostles. He was part of the inner circle. He had private access to Jesus. In fact, in Luke chapter 6 verse 13, it said that Jesus chose the twelve and he called them apostles Judas was an apostle, but he was never a follower of Jesus. He was never a true follower of Jesus. Here's another reason I think people deconstruct. And, and, I, and I would ask you to ask these questions. And, and what I would challenge you to do is I would challenge you to examine your faith. Because are my Christians just because I grew up in the church or have I had an encounter with Jesus? Because another reason that some people deconstruct is some people equate religious activity with following Jesus. When I watch some of these deconstruction videos, it, a lot of times it's like, I was a missionary. I was a pastor. I was a teacher. I taught Sunday school. I was a deacon. And yet I no longer believe. And you know, I was thinking about Judas. Judas was engaged in religious activity. If you go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> it talks about summoning his 12 disciples. He gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and heal every kind of disease. Does that mean that Judas at one point had the authority? Apparently so. He had the authority through Jesus to drive out demons and to heal sickness and disease. Now here's another one. Mark, he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him to send them out to preach. You mean Judas would preach? Yes. 
I was thinking about this. If Judas were alive today and Judas were to make a deconstruction TikTok video, he might start off by saying this, I was an apostle of Jesus. I was commissioned personally by Jesus to preach. I was given the power to cast out demons. I was given the power to heal all kinds of diseases. I was the treasurer for Jesus' ministry. But I don't believe anymore. Think about that. Judas never surrendered his heart to Jesus. You'll never read of a moment in Judas' life like you do in Peter, where Peter fell to his knees and said, get away from me for I am a sinful man. You won't read about that in Judas. Apparently there was never a time in his life where he, he had an encounter with Jesus. And I have a theory, this is another theory, because I asked myself, why didn't Jesus make Matthew the treasurer? Wouldn't that make more sense? I mean, Matthew was a tax collector. The guy knew numbers. Why Judas? Well, thank you. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> why did he make Judas the treasurer? You know why? I think Jesus was giving Judas chance after chance after chance to choose him over his love for money. Every time the money came in, this was a chance to show that I truly love Jesus, but Judas couldn't help himself. He loved the money more than he loved Jesus. And as Jesus' popularity grew, I think Judas was like, look at the money. Woo! This is going to be, Jesus is going to be a great cash cow. This is going to be awesome. If we could just charge for healings, Jesus, that would really make some money. You see... Judas didn't follow Jesus because he saw that he needed to be forgiven. He followed Jesus for the money. And when I watch these deconstruction videos, so many times it's, here's what I did, here's who I was, here's what I taught. I never hear them talking about I was pursuing a relationship with Christ. I, 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 I was, loved Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I never hear that. Maybe there's some out there, but I never hear them. Again, Judas said great things. He was a treasurer, cast out demons, preached about the kingdom of God, healed diseases, but money was his love, not Jesus. So I would challenge you this morning. Examine your heart. Why do you believe what you believe? Are you, I'm a Christian because I'm a member of Warren and because I attend church. Why are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Look at all the stuff I'm in. Really? Why are you a Christian? And also, I think that people deconstruct because Jesus' teachings conflict with culture and with self-interest. I think the reason you're seeing church attendance drop in America for one of the many reasons is because our culture used to be more Judeo-Christian based and as we're moving away from it and we're in conflict increasingly with culture. You know, Jesus taught that, that sex outside of marriage between a man and woman, any sort of sex outside of that marriage is wrong. But our culture says, no, it's okay. If it feels good, do it. Well, that's in conflict with Jesus. Jesus taught that every life is sacred. But our culture says, look, if that baby's an inconvenience, you can go ahead and take it. Abort it. And that's in conflict with our culture. And I think as our culture is moving further and further and further away from its roots, many people who said they were Christians are saying... I can't go there. My, all my friends believe this now. No, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be the oddball. And so they walk away from Jesus because they never had a relationship to begin with. I also think maybe another reason that Judas betrayed Jesus is he was hoping he could force Jesus' hand. He was hoping that if he betrayed him, Jesus would suddenly just... Poof, out would come the power and he would wipe out the Romans. You know, because all the Old Testament's about the Messiah, right, doing that. And so I think Judas like, I'll force his hand, he'll wipe out the Romans and he'll march in Jerusalem and he'll rule and reign and I'll get to sit there too. Like, I'm going to be part of the group, right? But at the end of the day, it was all about Judas. I'll, make, I'll just force Jesus into doing this so I can be elevated. And again, just remember what John said in John 13 too. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas. Satan, his demonic horde, saw Judas' love for money 
And Judas's self-interest was the most important thing, so they started whispering in his ear, why don't you betray him? Why don't you betray him? And I would argue that Judas had already turned away from Jesus while he was acting like he was following Jesus. While he was doing these things and being the treasurer, he was also working to subvert Jesus at the same time. Examine your heart. Another reason I think people deconstruct is Jesus exposes their heart. If you look at verse 20, this is now we're having the, the Last Supper. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then he said this. There we go. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. Jesus just exposed Judas right there. He's right there. He, he's the one. And in fact, in John chapter 13, it gives us a little more detail. John chapter 13, Jesus replied, He is the one I give a piece of bread to after I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas. Right then, Judas could have said, I'm not taking that bread. No, 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 you keep it. I'm not going to betray you, but what did he do? He took it. And Jesus exposed Judas. Now, the disciples didn't quite get it because they just couldn't fathom what was going on. But right there, Judas knew he was exposed. And a lot of people unfollow Jesus. They turn away from Jesus because Jesus exposes sin. And a lot of people just don't want to deal with that. They don't want their sin exposed. Because a lot of people, let's be honest, and we can be that way too, we're more interested in self-preservation and things. There's another reason. I want you to examine your heart. Examine your heart. And there's another one. Freedom from God. I know this sounds kind of weird, but Judas betrays Jesus. He leaves the room. And of course, Jesus and his disciples go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas knew that that's where he went because apparently when Jesus would go to the Mount of Olives, he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. That was his prayer place. So Judas knew that that's where he was going to go. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, the passage we looked at. <clears throat> and he, suddenly a mob came and one of the twelve named Judas was leading them. And he came near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I kind of think that's interesting. Now, in that culture, a kiss was used as a greeting, a friendship. But Judas wasn't kissing Jesus because he was his friend. I think it was a kiss goodbye. I'm done with you. I don't need you anymore. And if you ever watch deconstruction videos, you'll hear people talk about, I'm free. Since I've left the church, since I've left my faith, I am so free. Free to do what? To live however I want to. To do whatever I want to do. And let me be honest, they do experience freedom. Right? I don't have to get up and go to church this same morning. I can lay home and sleep in. This is so free. I, I don't have to worry about prayer. Or I don't need to spend time in the Bible. I don't need to be involved in ministry. I'm free. I can do whatever. And listen, it's a real freedom they feel. But there are consequences. Eventually. There are consequences. So when you, when you see deconstruction videos of people talk about how free and happy they are, don't be surprised because they are. In the moment, they're happy, they're free, they feel like, hey, I don't need to worry about God or anything like that. I don't have to worry about, you know, any of those things. But see, this is the, that right there tells you the root. If prayer is a chore to you, if spending time in God's word is, I just got to do this, that should be a red flag in your heart. Something's not right. If I don't want to spend time with God in his word, if I don't want to spend time with God in prayer, something's not right. It's become a duty and a chore rather than a relationship. And I think for a lot of people who deconstructed their faith, it was never a relationship. It was just a duty, just something I had to do, and now I'm free. So real quickly, we'll wrap up. How do you prevent 
deconstructing your faith. First of all, test and examine your faith. Here's what Paul says. Paul said this, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Here's my thing, the challenge. You and I need to examine our hearts. Why do I believe that Jesus is the only one? Why do I believe that Jesus has saved my soul? Why do I believe that I'm going to heaven? Why do I believe those things? Don't assume you're a believer. Test your heart. Examine your heart. And Peter says this. Here's why we need to do this. Brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Look at this. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, Peter says, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. Examine your faith. Examine it, first of all, objectively. Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you believe that? Do you believe he rose from the dead? Do you believe that he paid the price for your sin? If yes, why? Why do I believe those things? Because my mamaw told me, that's not a good reason. Why do I believe those things? And examine your faith subjectively as well. Objectively is the most important. But there is a subjective side. In other words, is your life different since you gave your heart to Christ? Do you know in your spirit? The Bible says that you'll know in your spirit that you're a child of God. Is there peace and joy in your heart despite the circumstances? Do you feel the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit in you? Those are things that are evidence of our salvation. Again, I was just thinking about this. How is some people examine their faith, but do not turn away when you have other people that just say, yep, I walked away from it? How do you have some people say, I'm no longer a Christian because I read the Bible, and then other people say, I read the Bible and now I am a Christian? Or I read the Bible and that strengthened my faith. Perhaps the person that says, I read the Bible and that's why I'm no longer a Christian, never examined their hearts to see if they were in the faith to begin with. It was just a duty. It was just a chore. They assumed they were Christians because they grew up in the church, served in the church, were members of the church, knew church lingo, maybe had been baptized. But they had never examined their hearts to see Do I truly believe what I believe? So I want to challenge you this morning. Examine your faith. My question to you today, are you examining your faith? I think you should do that your entire life. Am I really a believer? Do I really believe? And, and, and again, when we get into the pressures of life, that's going to reveal a lot of what's in our heart. When I think about Mary and her passing, and her last words were, just let me go, to me, that's the line a believer would say, I'm ready to go home. I don't want to live on this earth anymore. I, you guys know Mary. I mean, if there was anybody who was going to make it to 100, I thought it was Mary. She, you know, just a few weeks ago was here at church. She's driving her car still, which is a little scary thought. (laughs) But she loved Jesus. She was ready. Because you know as well as I do, if she couldn't have been up and around, she wouldn't want to keep going on this earth. And now she's hop, skipping, and jumping. And we'll see her someday. But you need to examine your faith. Am I really who I say I am? Let's pray. Father, I pray that every one of us in this room is a believer. That every one of us is, has and is examining our faith. Do we really believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Do we really believe he is the way, the truth, and the life? Are we willing to die for that belief? Oh God, I pray that we're not Christians in name only, but we are Christians who will stand for our Savior, who love our Savior more than anything else, more than money, 
more than self-interest, anything else, we love Jesus. I pray that we'll be true saints. And so that when the evil one comes after us, and he will, and he does, may we stand firm with our sword, the Spirit, strong in prayer, mighty in you. Because we've examined and we've tested our faith and we know who we are. May that be us. And Father, for those who have deconstructed their faith, I pray that they'll turn to Jesus. That in that process, they'll come to a point where they have to say, well, what do I really believe? And Father, for some it may take years, some it may take months. But I pray that for every person that's made those videos, Christian leaders and pastors on down, that you'll continue to hammer at their hearts and get them to open their eyes and to have a true relationship with you. Father, may we stand strong in the faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.